Hi, and welcome to the last lecture of the course. I'd like to wrap up the course by talking a little bit more about race and health. In the last lecture video, we talked about race as a social construction. We talked about how racialization and essentialization really work together to create a racialized society in the United States and elsewhere. And we also talked a bit about how institutionalized racism or structural inequalities had an impact on fair housing and education that led to segregation and thus unequal resources. And what I'd like to do now is take that a step further and talk about the impact that housing and education, as well as some other factors, have on health outcomes. So this I posted in the Canvas page. Um, I want to let you know that I'm not going to give you the answers just yet. Uh, I am looking forward to see how you categorize everyone and let you know that I will be posting the correct answers, if there are correct answers, um, in just a few days. And the correct answers are really based on how these individuals self-identify. But I think it gives you a good sense, as I talked about in the last one, about how race really breaks down at the edges. And so for people who um, aren't easily put into a category, what does that mean? So this figure is a really interesting figure. It was developed by Kawachi and, and co-authors um, co and some of their co-workers to look at the impact um, of socioeconomic status, or SES, education, occupation, and health. And it's referred to as the life course perspective. And it's the idea that your parental socioeconomic resources are going to have an impact on your educational attainment, which has an impact on your occupation and, in and income. And that occupation and income, oh, sorry, um, are going to have an impact on your retirement income. And that each of those things, your parental resources, your educational attainment, your occupation and income, and your retirement income, all have a direct impact on your health. But if you follow the arrows, your health as a child has an impact on your educational attainment. So think of it if you're a young child who has uncontrolled asthma, you're more likely to miss school, that's gonna have an impact on your educational attainment. If you are a young child who has health problems during childhood, that's gonna have an impact on your, ad on your health during adolescence and young adulthood, your health as an adult, and your health into your older years. And each of those things have an, have an, an impact, I'm sorry, on the next level, both in terms of socioeconomic and sociodemographic factors, as well as your health. And so it's not a one-to-one, -one, it's a web of causation. And because of this, because of that interaction between socioeconomic status, ed education, occupation, wealth, etc., and the impact that that has on your health behaviors, as well as what you have access to, Dr. David Williams has said that all policy is social policy and all policy is public health policy. And so when we look at policies that impact racism, housing and education, socioeconomic status, occupation and income, and access to health care, these are all things that have an impact on your health. So looking at the impact of race and socioeconomic status, there are currently 46 or almost 47 million people, or about 15-8% of the population, who had income levels below the poverty level. And the majority of those living in poverty in the United States, States are white. And that often comes as a surprise, but numerically, most of the population is white. However, poverty disproportionately affects some groups, including, including Native Americans, African Americans, and Hispanics. And so while the majority of those living in poverty are white, if you look at the distribution of poverty compared to the distribution of the population, they don't match up. So 77% of the population is white, 10% of the white population lives in poverty. 13% of the population is African American, 26% of individuals who are in poverty are African American. So you can see almost double the amount. Likewise, the Hispanic, the rate is higher, Native American and other Pacific Islander is significantly higher, and Native Americans and Alaska Natives are also overrepresented in terms of living in poverty. Racism also has 
an impact on how people are perceived and how they are prejudged. And so Montes et al. conducted a survey to ask people when seeking health care how they are viewed and looked at a number of negative perceptions. And these numbers are the percentages of individuals who viewed the race that way. And so 80% of people said that African Americans were poorer than whites. Same thing for Hispanics. Not quite as much for Asian Americans. 62% and 54% respectively of African Americans and Hispanics were viewed as being lazy or not hardworking. More than half were viewed as being um, violent prone. They're more likely to be viewed as unintelligent, on welfare, as well as unpatriotic. And that one actually goes straight across the board for African Americans, Hispanics, and Asian Americans. And so what does that do? Well, it has an impact, as we said, on housing. We talked about the historical context of covenants and redlining and blockbusting and the creation of these primarily white suburbs because of those perceptions that are, are hard to get rid of, right? So that we carry them with us. And as a result, you can see there's a significant amount of segregation that still happens, okay? This table goes up through 1990. And so unevenness is the percentages, the percent of blacks who would have to change residence to achieve an even spatial distribution. And isolation is the percent of blacks in a census tract where the average black person resides. And so the higher the numbers, the more segregation there is. And what you'll see here, this is the non-South and this is the South. Now, most of us, especially in this area, like to think of ourselves as being less segregated and maybe more woke, for lack of a better term, about issues of race and racism. But what you can see is that the non-South actually has higher rates of housing segregation than they're seen in the South. And that these numbers have only gotten marginally better, if at all. As a matter of fact, Long Island and communities in Long Island are amongst the highest or the most highly segregated in the nation. And Manhattan is quickly on its way to becoming the most highly segregated city in the United States. And what impact does that have? Well, it's been noted that minorities live in greater concentrations, both in areas with above average numbers of air polluting facilities and in air quality problems. And race is currently the best predictor of location of toxic waste sites. It has also been identified that many corporations that tend to pollute look at the racial distribution of communities before choosing where they're going to locate and are more likely to locate in areas of concentrated minority population, as well as overall poor populations. In the last video we also talked, or in a previous video, we also talked about the differential access to education by race and how education is tied to housing segregation as well as the differential funding. But there are also disparities by race in college prep classes. And African Americans and non-whites are disproportionately tracked into non-college prep courses and tend to be viewed with lower teacher expectations. that tracks them into blue collar jobs more likely than white collar jobs. And the creation of white suburbs and the movement of high pay, low skill jobs into those suburbs made it harder for individuals living in urban areas to access wealth. And both US based and foreign companies explicitly, as I said, use racial composition in their decision making process of where to locate new plants. And as a result, when you see economic downturns, they tend to impact African Americans and non-whites quicker. So during the 1990-91 economic downturn, there was an African American net job loss of about 60,000, while there was a net gain for other populations. And this is true at every level of education. So obviously, the rate of unemployment tends to be higher for those with less than a high school degree, but it's also true right along the line, and that again also tracks with race. So black, 
having the highest rate of unemployment, followed by Hispanic, and then white and Asian tend to be fairly similar. We have a tendency in this country, especially when we talk about health insurance, we'll just get a better job. Get a better job, you'll have better insurance. Isn't that easy? Well, Pager did a study and was actually looking not at race initially, but looking at the impact of having a criminal record on whether or not you were offered a job or called back. And what they found was that white applicants are favored over black applicants with identical, qual identify identical qualifications. But beyond that, blacks with an associate's degree are two times likely to be unemployed as compared to whites. And if you look here, a white person with a criminal record was significantly more likely to be offered a job than a black man with no criminal record. And if you look at the difference between having a criminal record when you're black and white, there's a pretty big gap there. In addition to these issues of criminal record, urban applicants in general are viewed differently than suburban applicants, particularly if they're perceived to be black, and they're less likely to be offered interviews, callbacks, and employment. And when they are employed, mean hourly wages for white male workers can be found to be as much as $6.50 more than for black male workers aged 40 to 51, which results in an average of thirteen of more than $13,000 per year. A lot of money. And as a result, you see that the median incomes for blacks and whites are significantly different, right? So we talk about the wage gap for men and women. There's also a wage gap by race where in 1996, African Americans were earning just 59 cents on the dollar compared to whites. And as a result, they were more likely to be living in poverty. And these income disparities hold true at each level of educational attainment. And so if you look, when you don't have a high school degree or a high school diploma, there's a difference of about $2,000 significant in terms of day-to-day -day life, but that doesn't go away when you get a high school degree, when you get an associate's or a bachelor's or even a professional degree, talking master's or beyond. As a matter of fact, as you go up in educational attainment, the gap between black and white income, median income, goes up. And as a result, the median wealth for white families is more than eight times greater than for black families. And so if you look at the wealth increase, not including, again, home equity, between 1984 and 2007, it has gone up dramatically for white families compared to African-American families. And things like your education and your occupation and your wealth have an impact on your access to and quality of health care. It impacts your ability to access and utilize health insurance. It impacts transportation in order to get to the doctor, and it also has an impact in, ter in terms of diagnosis and treatment, especially when we're talking about things like stigma in healthcare and physician, physician perception of patients by race. So there was a study done by Van, Ren, Van Rijn and Burke, which looked at the effect of patient race and socioeconomic status on physicians' perceptions of their patients. And so they were looking at a number of perceptions. So for the physician perception that the patient is, and they asked them if they were very likely to not at all likely. And then they looked at the difference between patients who were white and black. And in this case, patients who were black, I'm sorry, patients who were white were more likely to be viewed as not at all likely to abuse alcohol or drug, other drugs compared to black patients. White patients were seen as being, or perceived to be, more compliant with medical advice, more compliant or more likely to participate in cardiac rehabilitation. They were seen as being very too extremely likely to have a strong desire um, to be very physically active. They were seen as not lacking social support. 
when the physician was asked, is this the type of patient, is this patient the type of person I can see myself being friends with, they were more likely to respond positively to white than black patients. White patients were seen as being more intelligent, more educated, and more pleasant than black patients. And this is even after controlling for the, ra the race of the physician themselves. And so all of that has an impact, especially when you're thinking about whether they're likely to abuse drug and alcohol, comply with medical advice, and follow up with care, that they might be treated differently. Because if you think someone's automatically going to be non-compliant, you might not give them a more complex or more difficult um, medical regimen to follow. And the results of some of the differences in this care plays out in such that there is a 31 and a half year difference between the highest and the lowest rate of life expectancy. Whereas you have Asian American females having the highest life expectancy and the lowest life expectancy is amongst Native American males in this country. And that holds true when you're looking at pretty much the top, all the top 10 causes of death. So if you look for all-cause mortality, the African Americans are 58% more likely to die than white. Um, American Indians are close in ratio for all-cause mortality, but you can see for specific things like um, unintentional injuries, diabetes, and liver cirrhosis, they have much higher death rates from those causes. Asian Pacific Islander tend to be have a better um, age-adjusted death rates than compared to whites. And Hispanic Latino are sort of a mixed bag, but have much higher rates of things like diabetes and HIV. African Americans, however, have higher rates for heart disease, cancer, stroke, unintentional injuries, flu, diabetes, HIV, AIDS, as well as liver cirrhosis. And so when we're thinking about things like mortality, we can see that mortality rates for white men and women on average were 29% and 24% lower than for African Americans. And equalizing those mortality rates could have saved almost 900,000 lives. And while the average lifespans increase, the difference in life expectancy between African American men and white men has actually increased between 1960 and 1996. And in some parts of the country, Native American men are only expected to live into their mid-50s, which is incredibly young. And if you look at that and compare that to other countries and developing countries, um, it's much more similar there than we would expect in the U.S. And so studies have been done to look at disparities in healthcare. And so looking at physicians who, patients who are obtained a referral and considered appropriate candidates for coronary angiography, uh, angiography were different by race, even when you hold other characteristics the same. So with the same diagnosis, they're going to be referred for different procedures. And a race disparity um, was found also for recommendation of coronary revascularization among patients in the VA healthcare system, where there are no race differences in the ability to pay, and providers are paid by a salary. So there's no incentive to treat them differently. And that's a pretty big gap there. Among patients in Medicare, managed care who had a heart attack, African-American patients were significantly less likely than white patients to receive beta blockers, which are the established standard of care. And when looking at cancer, African-Americans are 10% more likely to suffer from cancer and 30% more likely to die from cancer than whites. And low-income people and people of color are less likely to receive cancer screenings. And without screenings, cancers are more likely to be detected at later stages. Among patients in Medicare, again, 65 and older, this covers everybody, so it shouldn't be a problem, African-American patients are less likely than white patients to receive a mammogram. And in a study of race differences in the use of three cancer screening procedures, African-American patients are less likely than white patients to receive each procedure. 
and these are all for cervical cancer outcomes. And in each case, it's a statistically significant difference and clinically significant as well. Thinking about asthma, 25% of Native American and Alaska Native children suffer from asthma, as does 20% of African American children. Between 1990 and 1997, African American children in California died of asthma at a, a rate of seven times that of white children. And many respiratory diseases can be managed through uh, medication and vaccination, but people of color and low-income people are less likely to receive those recommended immunizations. And so among adults in a managed care organization, fewer African Americans than whites reported care consistent with the National Asthma Guidelines, and that is for both self-management, medication use, triggers, and access to specialists' care. And incredibly sadly, infant mortality rates are nearly two times higher for African Americans and one time higher for Native Americans than for white children. Latinos, African Americans, and Native American or Alaska Natives are at least three times as likely as whites to receive late or no prenatal care. And we know that lack of prenatal care increases the risk of adverse outcomes um, or adverse birth outcomes. Among patients in the Veterans Affairs System, African Americans were less likely than whites to have their cholesterol check um, in the past two years and were less likely to have dilated eye exams. And after taking into consideration facility differences, African Americans received less likely to have LDL testing than whites who received care within the same facility. So this is not only this didn't take into account the type of facility. So within a facility, there was actually a slightly larger gap in terms of disparities for care. And among respondents to the National Health Interview Survey, African American and Hispanic patients age 65 and older were less likely to receive vaccinations for the flu and pneumonia, which we know can prevent death, particularly in that population, which is highly susceptible to complications for flu and pneumonia. Also among patients in a Medicare managed population, African Americans are less likely than whites to receive follow-up care or a follow-up with a mental health professional after a related hospitalization. And poor Latinos have lower access to specialty care than, non, than poor non-Latino whites. And African Americans classified as not poor were also less likely to have care. Again, looking at diabetes and complications from diabetes, African American patients are less likely than white patients to receive an eye exam, which is an established standard for diabetes care because one of the negative consequences for diabetes is blindness due to diabetic retinopathy. And so we talk about all of these things, we talk about all of these negative impacts of race on health care, which cannot be explained by simply access to health insurance. But it's not just race, because race interacts with other subgroups. So when you're talking about women, you have the multiplied impact of gender, race, education, and occupation. And for men, there's an impact of SES for men of color, which impacts their education and employment opportunities. And if you layer in cultural issues or cultural norms around sexual orientation, that becomes a layering effect. And children who are raised in low socioeconomic status families face more food insecurity. And more than 4% of children are currently living in what are considered food insecure households. And this is more common among children of color. So what can you do? Well, there are potential public health policy responses for each of these issues. You can look at how do you improve and train physicians to reduce their biases to improve the physician-patient relationship. You can try to increase access to health care and reduce inaccessibility due to financial and geographic barriers. You can address low quality and cultural inappropriate care 
that's being directed at community of colors. Right? There's a lack of comprehensive interpretation and translation services within many hospitals and cl clinics. We can think about how we can address income inequality, housing and segregation, workplace health and safety, and, acts and improving access to healthy food and exercise. And for each of these, again, there's a potential policy response. So you can look at developing standards of care for common diseases and illness. We can try to minimize barriers to patient re relationship building between patients and doctors. We can look at things like universal health care. We can expand employer contributions and responsibility for health care. We can continue to expand Medicaid and SCHIP and Medicare coverage and encourage the use of community-based primary care clinics, particularly in communities of need. We can increase funding for understaffed hospitals and clinics and make sure that there's access to specialized and urgent care for populations that most need it. We can provide access to highly trained medical interpreters and clinics can ensure that written materials and signage are translated into multiple language and are also culturally appropriate. We can improve quality public education and look at how to improve job opportunities. We can ensure that we have affordable and safe housing and expand and improve upon our public transportation. We can uphold the right of unions to organize and, uh, and pressure the government to enforce environmental standards. We can advocate for increased physical and health education in schools, for healthy school lunch programs, which were just cut, by the way, or fu some funding was cut. And we can encourage the communities to have access to healthy local groceries and markets by partnering with large corporations. Because if you recall, going back to that very first lecture on what is public health, it's not all done by the government. It really is a government, be a, I'm sorry, a partnership between government and private institutions coming together for the greater good to take that safety net, raise it up a little bit, and make sure that it's capturing everybody. And so going forward, you need to start thinking about what your role in public health is. No one can solve all of these problems. And it's really about finding coalitions and working together, whether that's something as simple as voting in your elections or taking additional courses in public health and related fields and finding the area where you can have an impact, whether that's in schools, counseling, in hospitals, in government, find the thing that you can do to improve the public's health. Thank you for taking the course. It's been a pleasure to have you.